Well, good morning. Let's close in prayer. Um, I actually do want us to start in prayer. Um, it's been a rough 24 hours in our nation. We have had two mass shootings. Uh, one in El Paso yesterday, one in Dayton, Ohio, I think this morning. Um, and I think it's good for us, although we may not know anyone who's there, involved. Um, these are reminders that the world is not the way that it is supposed to be. And we have another world which we look forward to. And we have a responsibility in this world to proclaim and show the way to that one. Join me in prayer. Father, our, uh, our hearts are heavy. Lord, if we're honest, maybe they're not as heavy as they should be. Um, but still, we, uh, we struggle with the fact that people, for no fault of their own, other than the fact that they live in a broken, fallen world, surrounded by broken and fallen people are suffering. Families are suffering because of the loss of loved ones. Um, Friends are suffering. Lord, I suspect families of the perpetrators are suffering and grieving. And Lord, what we ask is, although we may never know these folks, we may never meet them this side of heaven, that you would step into their lives in a powerful way. That in the midst of pain, they would discover the peace that is beyond all understanding. In the midst of grief, they would find the God of all comfort. Lord, help us not to take these things lightly, but to remember that these are the consequences of living in a sinful world. And you have called us to be your embassy, your ambassadors into that world to show that there is another way. Help us to do that faithfully. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, quick quiz. Um, Who here likes to watch sports on TV? I feel like I'm not getting a solid answer. I'm not getting truthful answers here. Who here likes to watch sports on TV? Okay, now I feel like I'm getting a more solid, more truthful answers. Um, Do you like to watch sports alone on TV by yourself? I, I do, right? Absolutely. It is so nice to not have to pay for parking. I don't have to deal with traffic. The food at home is so much cheaper than the food at the stadium. And I don't have to crawl over 18 people to get a Coke. But here's the thing. As fun as it is for me to watch a baseball game or a football game sitting on my couch at home, as great of an experience as that can be, I still love going to the stadium. I love watching the game live. It is a different type of amazing experience to be able to go to the game and hear the crowd and join the crowd and be with people that I may not ever know, I may have no real conversations with, but all of us are focused on the same thing and we are enjoying that moment together, even if the seats are uncomfortable, is really a cool experience. It's a different type of amazing experience, but it's an important one. The thing that's interesting is that in our culture today, and maybe even especially in our Christian culture, There is this strong temptation 
to reduce our experience with the Lord and our experience with the body of Christ, if you want to call it that, to basically experiences of isolation. We are in a society now, we have the technology now that every Sunday, if you want, you can have your own customizable service. Every Sunday, if you want, you can go to your favorite podcast and hear your favorite preacher. And if there is a specific sermon that you really like from that preacher, guess what? You can hear it every single Sunday. You can choose your own music. You can create your own playlist. You can have all of your favorite songs. You can create your own customizable worship experience. And you know what? There are things amazing and wonderful and glorious about worshiping alone and on our own and privately between us and the Lord. But there is a different type, an important type of experience that we have when we come together and we worship corporately. We worship together. We are in a series called Define the Relationship. And this is a series that talks about what is the nature of the church? Specifically, what is the nature of the local church? What are we here as FBC supposed to be doing? Who are we? What are we? And we have looked at what the church is, and we said that the church is built by Jesus. It is not built by us. He is the one who does the work. It is not us that gets the credit. We have looked at different metaphors that the New Testament uses for the church. We have said that the church is a family, and as a family, there is intimacy because of shared identity. The church is a body. There is great diversity within the church, but that diversity comes together in a unified way for his purposes. We are a people. We are like an embassy, an ambassadorship that is located within the fallen world. And we are here to represent the nation, the kingdom of God to a world that needs it. We are a temple. As a temple, we are a place where the presence of God dwells. We are a place where God is worshipped. We are a place where God is present. And we are a flock. We are a people under authority. That means we're a people who are, who are protected by the Lord. But we have someone whom we must follow. We must follow the Lord. And we must follow the leadership that he puts in place. Last week we shifted our focus to what the church does. And we looked at the fact that one of the things that the church must do is the church must preach the gospel. And we said it's not just preaching the gospel and evangelism out to a world that needs it, although that's critically important. We must, as the church, preach the gospel to one another and remind one another of God's grace and mercy and work in our lives. We have used this sentence to try to summarize the entire series. The church is a family of believers who are built by and belong to Jesus, united and set apart for the purpose of worshiping God and proclaiming the gospel. This week we continue in that series, and we're going to look at corporate worship. Now, um, by the time we're done, last week I had told you by the time we're done, you'd be able to evaluate my preaching. Um, so uh, this week, by the time we're done, you'll be able to evaluate Tyler. Um, <laughs> act, but please don't. Um, we'll talk about that. By the time we're done, what I really want us to understand is that we are a community of worship. And I want us to understand why we worship. I want us to understand the content of our worship. And I want us to understand how all of that plays out here at FBC. And I think when you see that, you'll actually be really impressed with Tyler. Um, what is the biggest crowd that you have ever been a part of? Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. Maybe if you're at a political rally, 
in Washington, D.C., you were at something that had 100 plus thousand people. Or if you're at our house for Christmas. Uh, this is a Rangers playoff game in 2011. I was at this game. There were tens of thousands of people at this game. This was back when the Rangers were good. The Rangers would be in the World Series this year, that year, not this year. Um, the place was dynamic. It was loud. Sound had feel to it. The crowd was like thunder. And the moment that you are seeing pictured in this picture is actually an historic moment, a first time this ever happened in the history of baseball. That guy that's the center of the picture is Nelson Cruz, who was an outfielder for the Rangers at that time. It's the bottom of the ninth inning. I believe there were two outs. The bases were loaded. He hit a grand slam home run to end the game. First time in the history of baseball that a grand slam home run was a walk, it's called a walk-off home run. It ended the game. And I can tell you, because I was there, the volume of the crowd shook the stadium. I mean, literally, the stadium was shaking. And I can still picture that moment. I can hear that moment. I can feel that moment. I can remember being there with my daughter-in-law, who was a Tigers fan, in that moment, and mercilessly giving her a hard time. But I want you to see something when you look at verse 9. As loud as that crowd was, as big as that crowd was, as dynamic as that crowd was, that crowd would not have even registered in the multitude that will one day be gathered to worship our Lord in heaven. This is a multitude, this is a crowd that no one could number. It can't be counted. It's interesting to me what this crowd does. We see in verse 10, they are crying out. They are yelling. And even though this is a crowd that can't be numbered, they are yelling with a loud voice. It is one voice. This would be a crowd that is louder than thunder, louder than any concert you have ever attended, louder than any NASCAR race you have ever been to. Millions, billions, an innumerable people yelling all at once. This is our future. This is us one day. After the game, when Nellie Cruz hit that home run, I remember walking out in, in the, the concourse area, and, and the volume just kept reverberating. It re kept reverberating in the parking lot. People were yelling, and people were celebrating. Why? Because the Rangers had won. It's interesting. That's exactly what's going on here. Palm branches were a symbol of victory. White robes were a symbol of purity. This is a celebration of victory. This is a celebration of complete victory over sin and death. This is a celebration of complete victory victory over everything that separates us from God. It is a victory that is celebrated by people who in any other context would be at war with each other. You see, the community of worship is as different as possible. The community that is gathered together to celebrate victory is made up of people from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages. These are people who share no background culturally 
They don't share the same language. They don't even necessarily share the same time frame. We are going to be gathered with people from the 1800s and the 1600s and the 1500s. We will be gathered with people from before the time of Jesus. This is as diverse of a group of people that could possibly be imagined. Let's be honest. This is a group of people, many of whom, on our own, we would never say, I choose to be with that person. These are people who are so radically different. But these are people who, despite their radical differences, come together celebrating victory over sin and death. And they do it with one voice, a voice that could drown out a hurricane. Revelation 7 is a picture of our future. Revelation 7 is a picture of of what the ultimate community of worship actually looks like. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are going to be in that crowd. But I don't want us to take for granted something that is very easy for us because we kind of grew up hearing these things if we grew up in the church. This is a radically unexpected community. I mean, think about it at the time of John when he wrote this. Christians were just a small group. They were fairly isolated in one part of the world. They were not politically powerful. In fact, they were the politically weak. They were moved by the powers and the movers and shakers of those society. Christians were being martyred. The last thing in the world they would have pictured for their future was a number that is beyond count celebrating victory. And it's unexpected in our time as well. It's unexpected because, frankly, we let the smallest things divide us from one another. It's unexpected because we do live in a world that wants to hold down our message. We do live in a world that doesn't believe what we have to say. In fact, we'll look at our values and look at our way of thinking and look at our approach to life and say, you are wrong. It's easy to lose sight of our future because of the struggles of our present. But God, in that moment, gives them this extraordinary picture. He gives them a vision of this diverse, unexpected community coming together to worship, coming together as victorious. And that is what we are when we come together here. We are an unexpected community coming together to worship because we are victorious through Christ. Can you imagine being with me at that game? My daughter-in-law can. Um, could you imagine being with me at that game? And on the way out after the game is... People, you know, 50,000 people are just still going crazy, and you're walking out. Some person comes up to you and says, um, hey, why is everyone celebrating? Well, I'd ask some questions. Um, first off, uh, have you met my daughter-in-law? Are you a Tigers fan like her? Um, you find out, no, no, this person's a Rangers fan, Okay. Were you actually here during the game? Did you actually see what happened during this game? Well, yeah, in fact, it looks like they're holding the baseball that Nellie Cruz hit out of the ballpark. Um, so, yeah, you were there. Do you understand the significance of what just happened? You understand that you saw something that's never happened before in the history of baseball, and you understand that you have just seen the Rangers move that much closer to going to the World Series. Do you understand the significance of what just happened? It's like, yeah, yeah, I understand all that. Then why are you confused about why everyone's celebrating? And then the guy says, well, the announcer was off tonight really just wasn't happy with the performance of the announcer. Did you notice that he mispronounced a couple of names? Did you notice that, that 
that some of his selection for the cheers that he played during the game were just a little bit weird. I mean, why at a baseball game do you say charge? Baseball players run in circles. That just seemed weird to me. And, you know, I just, I just can't celebrate when the announcer is off his game. I think you would look at that person and you would feel sad. You would feel sad because he was so focused on the wrong thing that he missed a truly extraordinary moment. If he had been focused on the right thing, the announcer wouldn't have mattered. You see, this person has confused the announcer and the cause of celebration. And guess what? We do the exact same thing. We do the same thing when we come together and worship. You see, verse 10 gives the cause for worship, the cause for our celebration. We worship because we are in awe of the God who redeems. The multitude responds to the fact that their salvation belongs to their God who sits on the throne of heaven and to the Lamb who is Jesus. I had this incredible privilege yesterday of performing a wedding for Harrison Griffin and Carrie A. Brown, two of the young people that have been in our church. And during premarital, I warned Harrison. I told him, I promise you what's going to happen. I said, I can try to describe it to you. Other people can try to describe it to you. I can try to warn you. But I promise you, the second that that door opens and your bride starts down that aisle, no one can prepare you for that moment. We are standing right here. And that door opened. And Kyrie started down that aisle. And Harrison's to my left. And he starts to shake. that as much as I could tell him about it and try to describe it, he could not anticipate what that moment was going to be like. When we look at Revelation chapter 7, I can try to describe it. I can try to picture it. But I cannot prepare you, and frankly, I cannot prepare me for the moment that the door is going to open and we are going to see God without the blinders of sin. We are going to see God who is the very essence of power, the very essence, the very definition of love and beauty and goodness and truth. We are going to see God and we are going to say, I have never understood what those words meant until right now. C.S. Lewis calls it living in shadowlands and someday we are going to see the real thing. And that, I think, is what it's going to be like. We will say, everything that I thought was love and beautiful and good and true and powerful and wonderful, they were only faint images of what is truly love and beauty and goodness and truth. And in that moment, when that door opens and we see that for the very first time, we are going to see something else. We will, for the first time, understand ourselves. We will, for the first time, understand how ugly sin is. We will, for the first time, understand how small we are. We will, for the first time, understand how little beauty and goodness and truth we really have. And when we see the wonder and glory of God, and we compare it to who we really are. We will worship. We will say the most unexpected thing that could ever happen in all of history has happened to me. This God, the essence of power and goodness and righteousness and love and beauty, this God who I never understood what these things were like before, this God 
loves me and calls me here. And he called me here at a price. Why does it say, and to the lamb? Because it's emphasizing that God saved us at the price of sacrificing his son like a sacrificial lamb. This God who is perfection looked at me and said, I love you. I want to be in a relationship with you. And I will pay the price to make that happen. We will stand together before the one who sits on the throne and we will be in awe that he is our redeemer. And that frees me up today. That frees me up right now. You see, I can come in here and I can feel emotionally drained. I can come in here and say, I am just absolutely not feeling it today. And guess what? I can worship. I can worship when the worship team has a bad day. Why? Because they are just the announcers. You can worship when I'm having a bad sermon. Why? Because I am just an announcer. But we, all of us, you are participants in the greatest blessing that could ever be imagined, even if we don't understand it. And we stand before God, our God, who redeemed us in absolute awe. And we can stand it, stand there in front of him in awe, even if we are feeling drained. You see, we are an unexpected community of worshipers. That's the who. We're standing together in awe of our God, our Redeemer. That's the why. But here's what's interesting. The why is also the how. The content of our worship. So imagine that we radically changed church service style. And we said, what we want to do is we want to base our church service on Revelation chapter 7. What would that actually look like? Right? You'd come in and you'd see people standing up, they'd shout, then they would fall down. And then they would talk. It's a lot like one of the FBC staff meetings when someone brings really good snacks. And then suppose as you're leaving, you're in the lobby, you hear people saying to one another, wow, that was really powerful worship today. That really moved me. What would go on in your head? And wouldn't you think, where's the music? I mean, I could at least, you know, I'm not a choir robes type of guy, but I could take choir robes over people standing and shouting and falling and talking. Or I may not be a drummer and guitar type of guy, but at least we would get some music out of it. Isn't it weird that these verses leave out the singing? Now, we know from other passages of Scripture that singing is an extremely important part of corporate worship, and it will be part of what we do in heaven. I just want to make the point that in this passage, where it describes worship and uses the term worship, there is no singing involved. And the reason I want to make that point is because corporate worship is more than just the music. The content of worship is our awe filled response to our God. And notice that it is a response. We are not the ones who initiate worship. God is the one who initiated worship. God is the one who pursued us. He is the one who sent the Lamb. When we worship, 
we are joining in something that God has already initiated that even the angels of heaven are participating in right now. Worship is a response to who God is and to what he has done. The content of our worship is our awe-filled response to God. And that takes a lot of pressure off of us. It takes a lot of pressure off of us because I don't have to come in here and generate an emotion. I don't have to come in here and look to the people who are on this stage and say, you must generate an emotion for me or else I haven't worshipped. We don't have to come in here and say, God, show up, come to us, join us. Even though many songs in the Christian church today say that. Where is God when two or three are gathered in his name? He's here. He's already here. He is the one who is calling us to worship. We don't have to put that type of pressure on ourselves and wonder, do I have to invite God here? And, and if, I, if I can't generate the emotion or if I can't get excited or if I'm just not feeling it today, maybe God won't be here. No, God is here. He is the initiator of worship, and the acceptability of our worship is not based on how we feel. It is because it is a response to who God is and what he is doing. The angels are worshiping God, and listen to what they say. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Let me retranslate that for you. What they are saying is, God, you deserve and you will always deserve forever the best that we can say about you. You deserve and will always deserve the most importance that we can give to you. You deserve and you will always deserve the best thoughts that we could possibly have. You deserve and will always deserve credit for every good thing that happens. You deserve and will always deserve to be treated like a treasure. And you deserve and you will always deserve to do whatever you want for as long as you want. That's what those words mean. That's what he is saying. The angels are declaring that there is no one like God. He gets all the credit. He always deserves to be followed. He always can be trusted. Always, always, always. There is no one like God. The content of worship is this. It is saying, God you and you alone deserve our awe because of who you are and because of what you've done. Another way of saying that is we are simply saying back to God how we experience him and what we have experienced because of him. And again, that frees me up. It's okay for me to be here and say, I'm not feeling it on a Sunday. It's okay for me to say, I don't need someone to make me feel that way. Because on the days that I'm not feeling it, what I can say is the best thoughts that I have today, the best that I have today, I put those thoughts with everyone else who is here, and I lift them up to you. The best that I can treasure you today, the best I can do, I put that with all these others who treasure you, and we together lift them up to you. The most that I can trust you today, I put it together with the trust and dependence and reliance of all of the people who are here, and we lift them up to you. And God looks at that and says, I am pleased with your worship. I trust, Lord, even as I'm not feeling it, that you accept my worship 
because the content of my worship is awe of you. What does that look like in FBC? You, um, you may not notice this, but we actually have a very intentional structure to how we put together a service. Again, the entire service is meant to be worship. It's not just the singing. Let me show you what I mean. Announcements are a declaration. God is at work at FBC. If you think that all announcements are, are just getting you up to date on what's going on, then we have put the emphasis in the wrong place. It's not about what we are doing as a church. It is about what God is doing. And it is a reminder that God is at work at FBC. And as we look at announcements that way, it changes our heart. Because it's about God's work more than it's about our work. When we do the missions moment, we are making a declaration. Our declaration is being made to us as a church. That not only is God at work at FBC, God is at work globally. And as we understand the missions moments in that way, it changes our hearts. Because our hearts, our natural tendency is to care more about ourselves and our own and our immediate sphere than anything else. And it softens our hearts every time we are reminded that God is at work globally to those who are outside of our sphere. We do what's called a call to worship. It's the words that are said or the prayer or the scripture that is read right before we go into the songs. A common misconception is that the call to worship is a worship leader calling to you, the congregation, to participate now in worship. That is not what the call to worship is. The call to worship is a reminder that God himself, who sits on the throne, invites us and calls us here together. It is a call from God to us. It is a declaration to us when we, every time that we do that, that God is at work in us and he is pursuing us. And as we participate in that, as we see that call to worship as a declaration of God at work and God pursuing us, it changes our hearts and we yield ourselves more to him. From the call to worship, we go into singing. You notice that the rhythm is starting to take place. There is declaration and response, declaration and response. And in our singing, we respond to the declarations about God. We say, we declare, affirm, this is who God is, and this is how he is at work. And we trust his character, and we trust what he is doing in our lives. And the Holy Spirit takes that and changes our hearts and deepens that trust and that love for him. Then we move to a reading of scripture. It is a declaration that God is revealing himself to us. And that works in our hearts. That the words of life are found in God's word. And then we take an offering. And an offering is not just about financially supporting the church. An offering, we say it every Sunday, but we can skip right past it in our thinking. It is an act of worship because it is a response to who God is and how God is at work. It is a response that says, I trust and believe that God is providing for me. And the world says that my security is based on what I own and how much I have. And that is not true. My security and my well-being are in God's hands. And so I can do a counter-cultural revolution and give up what the culture says is precious because I trust who God is. The sermon is a declaration. This is who God is, and this is how we should respond to who he is. Very often, we haven't done it in a while, but we'll do a closing song. Why do we do that? Because we want to do a response where we together affirm what has been said about God. And then you notice that I always end the service with ascending. 
with a benediction. Because it is a declaration to us that God is who he said he is in Scripture. God goes with us as we leave here. And the Holy Spirit takes that and works in our heart. That life with God is an all week long life. It even reminds us that the church is not a building. We are the church. And the church goes with us when we depart, as does the Lord. Our services are intentionally set up to be a declaration response, declaration response, declaration response. It's subtle, but it's important. I think Tyler is very intentional about this. It doesn't mean we can't change the order. It doesn't mean we can't do things in here that are different. But Tyler is mimicking what happens in heaven. This is who our God is. This is how we respond. There's something else that's very subtle that goes on at the same time. But it's extremely important. You might remember this chart from last week. This is a snapshot of the gospel. The gospel says this. We have a problem. We're separated from God. We got into that problem because we are sinners. And because we are sinners and separated from God, we experience a life that is filled with fear and guilt and brokenness. And that leads us to try to control the world around us. And there is a solution. The solution is union with Jesus in his life and death and his resurrection. And we enter that union as we repent, believe, and follow Jesus. And the result is a life that is lived with God. Here's what's fascinating. Our services are designed to act this out. Our services are designed to be a subtle but, but tangible reenactment of the truth of this. And we do it in different ways. Sometimes we'll actually do a prayer of confession where we name the fact that we are, sin, that we are sinners, that we sin and do things that are wrong and that we tend towards a life that is governed by fear and brokenness. And then we are reminded that we have union with Jesus and that we can have life with God. That might happen within a song. It might happen over the course of several songs. This morning, one of the ways it happened was a communion. Our sermons are always designed to reinforce this. So we'll talk about the fact in almost every sermon that there are things that we tend to do that move us into life governed by fear, guilt, brokenness, and control. This morning's sermon, let me name what that is. We tend to make worship about us. Life with God is what is open to us and available to us if we will pursue it. And that is life where worship is about the one who sits on the throne. Every time we come together, we look for ways to reinforce the gospel, both in what we say and in what we do. Corporate worship is extremely important as a church. It's when we come together and we have an appetizer of heaven. We are a group of people who are very different, who have been brought together by God's gracious salvation. We stand together in awe of God for who he is and what he has done. And we respond by saying back to him what we experience of him. And God looks at that and says, I am pleased. We are an unexpected community in awe of our Redeemer. That is the picture that Romans or that Revelation 7 gives us of our future. And that is what we enact out today as we anticipate that to come. Eventually, sadly, shockingly, the analogy of a baseball game and heaven breaks down. See, when this picture was taken, I was up there somewhere like a level up. Um, I was an observer. If you had gone back 10 seconds, the crowd would not have been doing this. It was Nolan Ryan and his wife. They would not have been doing that. They might have been standing. I can't remember. But they weren't doing this. 
And that's because we were all observers. I didn't do anything. This crowd didn't do anything until someone on the field made something happen. I was not actually a participant in the game. When they won this series, I didn't get a bonus check like they did. And that's where the analogy breaks down. When you walk in here, you are not an observer. You are a participant every bit as much as me and everyone else. You do not wait for other people to make you celebrate. You celebrate because what God has done and is doing in you right now. He is the one who has made you a participant. And that is all you need to be in awe of him. He, the God of the universe, is your redeemer. How do we respond? I'd encourage you to read That's the, that's the ones from last time. But you have them in your handout, so let me read them for you from the handout. Read Revelation 19, 1 through 10. What causes awe of God and worship in these verses? Share, tell someone this week why you are in awe of God. Pray that the Holy Spirit will show you more of the wonder of God. And practice, make the drive to church a time to reflect on God's work in your life. You know what's interesting? When the Israelites gathered for worship, their preparation for worship did not start when they walked in the room. Their preparation for worship started as they were approaching because they weren't dependent on anyone to lead them into worship. They knew who they were worshiping and why. And that's all I'm inviting you to do. On the drive here, start the discipline of preparing for worship then, remembering who your God is and what he's done. There's one other thing I want to announce, and this is directly related to worship. You should have received one of these on your way in. If you didn't, uh, they're out at the community information desk. It's about online giving. We're changing how we do that at FBC. And if you weren't here earlier, there's actually a typo on this. Uh, it says that the number that you need to type is 7797. The correct number is 77977. Um, and you can use that with your smartphones, with your computer, uh, to set up, to participate in worship by declaring we depend on the Lord for our well-being and not on our stuff. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. And as they come forward, I want to remind us that these folks are here to pray with you no matter what you are experiencing. They are here to pray with you, to join with you, to stand with you before the one who sits on the throne of heaven and say, this is your beloved child who is in need. Care for them. And we want to do that with you. Would you pray with me as we close? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we are here not because of our own initiative, but because you have called us. We are so grateful that the picture that we have in Revelation 7 of what worship will one day look like, we can experience in part today. And Lord, I ask you, I ask you that you would soften every one of our hearts. Open our eyes to see more and more of your wonder that we would be more and more in awe of you. That when we come in the doors of this church, we would come in here not waiting for someone to make us feel something. But we would come in here knowing that you are the God who has called us. And you have made us your people. And that is all the reason that we need to say, Father, thank you. Thank you. And we love you. Lord, help us to do that every single day. For your glory, not for ours. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me leave you with this thought. I feel bad you didn't make your stand. Um, 
This is what the angels said about God. All praise and glory and wisdom and gratitude and honor and power and strength belong to God forever. When you leave here, my charge for you is to remember that is your God. And when you come back next week, walk through the doors having remembered that that is your God. You are dismissed.